Greg Dell with Attorneys Dell and Schaefer here with attorney Alex Palomara, and we're going to talk about long-term disability insurance claims for ENT, also known as otolaryngologists. And I think I pronounced that right because I often have difficulty with that name. But um, Alex, we've represented hundreds of ENT doctors throughout the years, and it's a super interesting profession because a lot of times the disability carriers don't realize that I would say 90% of these ENT doctors are surgeons and yep. surgeons in the sense that they're doing from minor procedures to major procedures. And I'm not even just talking about surgeries in the OR, such as the, you know, the tonsillectomies, the ear procedures, the, the, all of the nose related procedures, um, uvolectomies, tons and tons of procedures that they do, but also in the office. I mean, they're, you know, the scoping that they're doing in the office on more than half their patients is a procedure. It actually has a code that comes up as a surgical type code. So it's a very demanding, uh, very demanding job that whether you're just in the office or you end up in the outpatient OR or you end up in the ER, there's also the high level, sophisticated, uh, long complex procedures with facial reconstruction that ENTs get involved with. So there's a whole gamut of it. But in the disability policies, Alex, what is an ENT from the general definitions of disability that you usually see going to have to prove in order to get their benefits secured? Well, whether it's a group policy or individual policy, I mean, the definition of disability typically starts the same. They have to prove that you're unable to perform the material and substantial duties of your own occupation as an ENT. You know, a lot of times the insurance companies kind of like, they like kind of like to dumb down the requirements of being a, a, an, an ENT. Um, they could try to say it's a sedentary job or a light duty job where you're on your feet but not really doing too many physical things. But you know, there is a lot of physical aspects to this job where these doctors might be on their feet all day, bending down, doing the surgeries, uh, obviously using fine finger movements and using their hands uh, very, uh, you know, an extensive degree. Um, so we have to prove to the insurance company not only that you have the inability to you know, physically prove your job, but there's also the cognitive requirements as well. So if you're in, if you're um, you know, a trained ENT and you have, um, you know, you're have dealing with chronic pain, uh, it's hard to, to work on a client, do surgeries, or even do consultations when you're concentrating on your own pain. So there's a, obviously a cognitive requirement of being this, doing this type of work and also a physical requirement as well. And one of the first things you have to do when applying for benefits or trying to prove your claim is you might have to prove to the insurance company what it is you do on a daily basis as an ENT. You can't let them just box you in a corner and use what they kind of like to use the dictionary of occupational titles, which is you know a, a general um, you know government definition of what this occupation does. And you have to get into more specifics to prove what your vocational requirements are. And so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because the way in which the disability company is going to look at what an ENT do, does is they're going to look at the CPT productions for the ENT, and they're gonna look at the production basically for the whole practice. And those are the production codes when they fill out the super bill when a patient comes in and, and how they bill. And they're gonna see how things are broken down. And they're gonna to try to figure out from that the way in which an ENT spends his or her day. The struggle that, that, that often comes is a lot of the ENTs are generating a lot of revenue from their procedures, and yet they're spending more time in the office. And so the disability carrier might say, well, we know you can't do your procedures, but it looks like you can still have an office practice and still make a living. And what the disability companies don't realize is that, especially the ENTs that do surgery, is that once the word's out, that an ENT is a specialist, Alex. So once the word's out, that this ENT can't operate on a person who has a major hearing problem, um, you know, or whatever the particular issue is that might need surgery, because that's why most of the doctors refer the ENT, that ENT is going to stop getting referrals. Yep. And when the referrals start to dry up, you can only live so long on your existing patient practice. I mean, maybe you cover the bills, probably not, but that in itself is not enough to continue a practice. And, and if you can work in a limited capacity, but not enough to where, you know, you're making any money, does that mean that you're going to qualify for total disability? So, I would say in most cases, yes, you will, because the reality is, is that you're not able to perform all of the material and substantial duties of your occupation. And the fact that you might be able to perform some of them that were incidental to your surgical means that you would qualify for total disability. So 
The other thing, Alex, we see is in these CPTs, a lot of these ENTs might do allergy shots. They do hearing tests. They do um, specific scans in the office and they make a lot of income from that, but they don't actually provide the services themselves. They might have an audiologist. Um, they might have a, um, uh, a radiology type tech who, who does the testing, you know, for whatever types of scans or other tests they're doing in the office. And that might generate 25, 30% of their revenue, but the, but the ENT has nothing to do with it. So the disability carriers try to use that against them and say, well, we still see you have all this revenue source that you can continue doing because of the fact that the CPT production is follow is fa is falling under their production. And that's not fair, you know, to them. Um, ENTs, you know, a lot of training, Alex, and we see with a lot of doctors that they often know what's wrong with them. Right. And so they might speak to a colleague and get some guidance here and there, and they don't get the best medical treatment. How important is strong medical documentation in order for an ENT to prove their disability claim and get awarded benefits? Yeah. I mean, the key to the claim is proof, you know, you know, whether you're making a claim as an ENT or, or any type of uh, doctor or professional, you have to prove your claim. And by proving your claim, proof is in the form of medical documentation and support from your treating providers. And like you're saying, some doctors, are, you know, my father's a physician. I don't know if he's seen a doctor in the last 20 years other than talking to his friends, if you have this, that, and the other, but nothing's documented. So the only way you can prove this claim is by documentation. So you actually have to go to the doctors and whatever your complaints are, whether it's a back issue, psychological issue, whatever it may be, or hand issue, you have to go see the, 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 the I guess maybe a primary care physician and maybe a specialist as well, preferably the specialist, so it's documented what you're going through, what your complaints are, whether there can be any objective evidence, any you know, diagnostic testing done, so that when you're ready to make the claim or if you're already on claim to continue proving to the insurance company that you can't do, do the duties of your own occupation. So proof is the most important thing for these claims for sure. Right. And it's got to be super strong medical documentation, not just I saw Dr. ENT and he has this complaint and that complaint and I think he shouldn't work. You know, it's got to be, um, you know, far more <laughs> detailed than just your basic stuff where the disability carrier is going to eat it up and deny the claim. Right. I mean, most people reviewing the claims, I mean, at least the initial person reviewing the claim at the insurance company are typically lay people. So you want it to be as strong as possible and hopefully as easy to read as possible because some of these people, you know, they're not specialists. They don't have a nursing degree. They don't have a, do you know, they're not doctors. I mean, ultimately the insurance company might have a specialist or a physician or a doctor review or, or a nurse review the claim. But the first people that lay eyes on this claim are going to be lay people. And maybe if the second round will be a nurse and maybe the third round might be a physician. But has to be as clear as possible for these insurance companies to get what's going on with your claim. And, and Alex, the other issue we deal with all the time, and I can think of three or four ENTs that have been contacting uh, myself back and forth over the last year and a half, is that doctors, not just ENTs, but doctors in general, they have a medical condition, it's chronic. They've been dealing with it on often, it's, it's way more than six months. It's usually 12 months to, to 24 months. And, They've gotten some treatment. Sometimes it's well documented. Sometimes it's not. And they're continuing to work through the issue. And they don't want to give up their practice, obviously, for a variety of reasons. One, they train their whole life to get to this point. They love their practice. They like what they do. Number two, they're going to make a lot more money continuing in their practice than they are on disability. So they really don't want to give up the income to get on disability. Yet they keep working and they get to the point where they're like, okay, I got to stop. Well, the ones that call us beforehand and have the opportunity to put a plan in place before they just decide to stop have a great likelihood of getting approved. The denials we often see are this exact person that I'm describing who worked through their condition for a long time and then just decided to stop working. And Alex, as you know, the disability carrier says, what changed? Why okay. all of a sudden now were you not able to work when you were able to do all of these other things? So. You know, we work with the doctors to put a plan in place to show a reduction in duties or document why you reached the point that you can't do what you used to do anymore. And this is why you have to go on disability. So there's a lot you can do to avoid this scenario. But Alex, is this a common situation that you see in almost all of your claims with basically any doctor that's worked through their medical condition? For sure. I mean, you, physicians, they're not typically wimps, you know, ENTs, any type of medical professional are, are typically not wimps, you know, so they try to, you know, grit and bear it and, and deal with the pain or deal with whatever they're going through. 
And they go, like you said, they've, they've worked 30 years and built the practice up so much, they're gonna have a loss of income and everything they worked for is gonna go away. You know, and unfortunately the insurance companies do love to make that argument that like, what's changed? You've been dealing with us for the last nine months or the last year and a half, what's changed? Now you can't work all of a sudden? And look at your, you know, your earnings from the past year, they're higher than ever, what's changed? And the truth right. of the matter is sometimes, you know, it's gotten worse, Something that, sometimes it has not even changed. And, and oftentimes I have to use the argument, it's a testament to their character. They try to grin and bear it. You know, they could have made this claim a year and a half ago. You guys should actually throw him a, a parade because he saved you the last 18 months of benefits that could be 5,000, 10,000, or 20,000 a month. He, he left that money in your pocket insurance company, and now you're trying to use that against him when he was actually saving you a lot of money. So there, there's arguments to be made to get around this. You know, no matter what, you have to look at the proof of your documentation, you know, the proof of your claim, the medical records, and say, yes, um, I did grin and bear it, but look where I'm at now, and I should not have grin and bared it. My medical records prove my condition. Just because I've been a superman, you should not be holding this against me. Um, but some, like, like you said, it's always best to contact us first so we can get a plan of, of action in place for this claim so we don't have to go through this because we want as, as few reasons as possible for the insurance company to deny these claims. And the, the fewer the reasons, the more likely we can get you on claim and, and keep you on claim as long as possible. You know, the, the other scenario I've seen, Alex, reminded me with the ENTs is that I've had many clients who have brought in physician assistants to work in their office because there's a lot of work that specifically trained physician assistants can do in the ENT field. And these doctors, when you mention that doctors are making more money while they're on disability, the doctors end up making more money because they can see more patients through the ENT and the doctor isn't doing a lot of the things they used to do. And sometimes they just become like a meet and greet while the ENT actually is doing all the procedures. The and what PA really should, oh, sorry, while the PA is doing all the procedures and the ENT is kind of there greeting the patient and kind of doing a follow-up look or looking at what on the scope screen and what's going on. And what's happened in that scenario is that probably that ENT should have filed a while ago. They should have filed when they brought in that PA to take over a lot of the things that the that the ENT was having difficulty doing. So that's another thing that I've seen, and I've actually dealt with that on at least 15 to 20 different cases for ENTs with the PA ENT relationship. So you brought up some some great points there, Alex. Um, you know, in summary, if you're an ENT, feel free to give us a call at any time. What we'd like to do is offer you a free initial consultation where we review your disability policy or we review a denial letter if you've been denied by the disability company. And we're gonna let you know right away how we think we can help you. The other thing that we recommend you do is to go to our website and search up your company and take a look at all the information we have about your policy, about your company. The reason for that is that we've written summaries about lawsuits dealing with your company. We've written success stories that we've had on behalf of other clients. We have lots of questions and answers specific to your company. And we also have comments and reviews from other people that have your exact disability company so that you can start to get a flavor for what this world is that you either have been in or you're about to walk into in terms of dealing with a disability claim. We really, really want you to be educated about this process and more importantly, about your company. Obviously, you're taking the first step by even watching this video and then reaching out to us because you know there's cause for concern when it comes to filing a long-term disability insurance claim and also keeping your benefits getting paid because approval does not mean they're gonna to continue to pay you. You always have to meet that burden every month and that can be a lot in an ongoing process to keep your benefits from being paid. So no matter where you're located in the country, we help clients everywhere. We'll be here when you need us and we look forward to the opportunity to speak with you.